Uh, and it's my really great pleasure to introduce uh, Sharon Crook. Uh, she's at the University of Arizona State, uh, both at the mathematical and statistic uh, and also the life science schools. Uh, she has done absolutely fantastic uh, contribution to the field in terms of modeling, uh, both at the, you know, the cell level and the network levels, uh, all those uh, statistical models. Uh, and, but also, she is one of the lead developers of NeuroML, which is uh, like a standard for, uh, uh, for those models. Uh, so I think uh, it is really uh, a great pleasure and honor uh, to have you, Sharon. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks so much. OK. Uh, well, thank you also to the program committee and the organizers. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, it was such a great meeting, so many great topics. I'm really excited to hear from everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about reproducibility, something that many of you work on here in this, in this audience. So it's not new to you. Um, but I'll be talking about reproducibility in the context of computational models. Um, and so we all know that reproducibility is really the cornerstone of science. It's, you know, it's really important. It's something that many of us work on resources and software packages, all kinds of things around reproducibility. With computational models, similar to data, um, in order to reproduce models, we need to uh, have those models be accessible. We might want to um, use different kinds of simulation packages to run them. So we want them to be interoperable. We want them to be um, uh, kind of transparent. And, and we want to be able to access all aspects of the models. And then obviously, if we can reproduce the model, then we, it's available for reuse. So these should be things that um, sound familiar to this audience. Um, and uh, so really what we want are models that are fair. Just like we talk about fair data, we want fair models. Um, and in, if you go to the INCF website and you, and you see what they're talking about in terms of fair, what are some of the aspects of, of um, these aspects of sharing data, and I'm telling you also sharing models, you'll see that standards really play a key role. Right? So if we want interoperability, if we want to be able to access all aspects of these models, then uh, we need to have standards for how they're shared. So I'm going to talk some about that today and about different resources that um, are out there, this whole ecosystem now within computational neuroscience that um, supports reproducibility. So on top of these aspects of models where they need to be fair, um, I also, you know, the title of my talk also includes the word rigor. And so in modeling, when we talk about rigor, what we, or at least what I mean, <laughs> is that um, we want to be really transparent about what data we're using to constrain models, optimize models, what are the features of data, um, if, if they're sort of higher level models, what are the features that are important in, in creating these models. Um, and um, similarly, you know, um, after we create the model, we want to validate it with different data. You know, what are those data? What, are, what kinds of data are we using to validate models? What are the aspects of models that are important? And so I won't get into this a lot today because of not having that much time, but I will touch on this a little bit, this idea of testing models, evaluating models, and how important it is, especially when we're talking about reuse. Um, you know, there are now thousands of models out there, and if we make more and more of them available, then we want people to be able to evaluate them well and decide based on their criteria, you know, whatever it is I want to do with this model, um, how do I evaluate the model and decide if I want to reuse parts of um, existing models. So these are some of the things I will touch on. Okay, so when we talk about standards, um, for data-driven models at multiple scales, I've been working for quite some time on a resource that is available for describing models. Um, you know, so what do we mean by describing models? You might just think, well, we just need to share the equations. Of course, um, that has limited use um, when we're talking about very complex models um, that are modular, that are you know, large scale, like the kinds of models we heard about this morning when uh, Yvonne gave that great talk. Um, so um, we need to do more than just share the equations. We want to share, you know, what do the variables represent? What do the parameters represent? What are the units of the parameters? Um, what are the biological entities that are being um, represented in our models? And this is what NeuroML is designed to do. 
So I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of the technical aspects of NeuroML. Um, there are plenty of resources out there. You can read papers. You can look at you know, the website. You can um, contact me and find out more about NeuroML. But I want you to understand a little bit about it so that when I talk about resources, you'll see why we're relying on NeuroML with these resources. So I'm just going to give a simple example. So, so let's suppose we have a relatively simple model that can rep be represented with a couple of equations, a handful, two handfuls of parameters. And um, this particular model here um, by Brett and Gerstner, or first introduced by Brett and Gerstner, um, if you choose you know, a particular point in parameter space, a particular instantiation of this model, um, you can, uh, you can have different kinds of behavior. So the model is, uh, is nice for representing a lot of different kinds of um, uh, spiking activity that you see in neurons, as you see here in, in, this, uh, in this figure. So in NeuroML, we have this concept of this adaptive exponential integrate and fire model. And to represent a particular um, instantiation of this model, what you need is the list of parameter values. What are the numerical values for these parameters? And then you have what you need for the model. But of course, this is just you know, a concept, a high-level concept. And so underneath that, we have um, these components um, that are used in NeuroML are defined in um, uh, sort of a supporting language called LEMS. And so what LEMS does is it's very flexible. It allows us to specify what are the equations underneath these concepts. We can add um, information about units. So for example, if you have some um, simulation package that will work with LEMS models, or work with NeuroML models, you know what the units are. You can do unit checking. You know, all these sorts of things um, uh, are added uh, you know, value to using a standard like NeuroML, because you can get more out of it. Um, so, I mean, this, so this is kind of the main takeaway from, from this slide is just that we have these high-level concepts that are around um, models and, uh, you know, um, formalizations like Hodgkin-Huxley conductances, things like that, that are very commonly used in neuroscience. It's built on top of this um, description language that is machine-readable that gives us all the information about the equations and a lot of other information as well. And... Um, one other thing that I want to point out is that NeuroML is quite modular, right? So if I have, for instance, a network model, again, going back to the talk this morning, the plenary talk this morning, if I have a, comp a, a network model with a large number of cells, then I can think about um, specifying the models for each cell and then putting those together to create the network, right? So you could, um, with NeuroML, you can grab you know, just the model for the cell or even just the model for a particular channel that is in that cell quite easily with having to, without having to go through a bunch of code and you know, find where is this channel specified in code. So it's meant to be simulator independent, um, modular, easy to access and reuse um, models and components of models. All right, so there are quite a few tools that have some support for um, import and export of NeuroML or parts of NeuroML. Um, you can find out more about them on our website. There are only a few mentioned here. Of course, one of the most important things is if, if this standard is going to be um, useful at all, we need to have models in NeuroML so that we can share them, evaluate them, reuse them um, moving forward, right? Okay, so there are several databases, like for instance, Neuromorpho. Many of you might be um, familiar with that morphology database from um, Giorgio Ascoli's lab. Um, you can get um, the cells there in a format that is, uh, that is you know, part of NeuroML, how in NeuroML you describe morphology. So that's just one example. Okay, so another place where you can get NeuroML models is at NeuroML um, DB. Um, so this is um, a database that's specific for models that are in NeuroML format. And I, th and I think that will become clearer why it's useful to have that in a minute um, when I show you more about the database. Um, um, it's complementary to other resources that I will, um, I'll, you know, I'll mention in a minute um, that sh also uh, make NeuroML data available. Um, but one thing to maybe keep in mind is these are, the models that are shared through NeuroMLDB are kind of snapshots. It's, 
you know, maybe a model that's already been published. It's at kind of a, um, you know, it's, it's at a sort of stable um, configuration. It's a model that somebody thinks is useful to share with the community. Um, so if you go to this website and, um, and you want to search for a model, you can search by keyword. You can search, you know, put an author name into the, into the bar, um, you know, basically anything you can think about, because all of these models have a lot of semantic information associated with them. So if it's a published model, for instance, um, we have all the information about the publication, we have the PubMed ID, all that is associated with the model, it's in the NeuroML file, so that when you get that model, you have all that metadata information as well. Um, okay, so, and, and I also wanted to mention that if you search there, um, we have ontological information, uh, in uh, one of our search routines. So for instance, um, for a lot of these models, we have Neuralex IDs associated with them that give information like uh, you know, what the cell type is that's being modeled or what the brain region is. And so we can use this information um, to help you find models that you might be interested in. So the example that I show here, uh, so specifically looking for a granule cell, right? Well, the granule cell comes up because that's a keyword. It's in the name of a model, right? But then um, because um, we know that granule cells are in the olfactory bulb, it, the ontological part of the search engine will show other cells from the olfactory bulb. So that's kind of the idea. All right, so if I click on one of these cell types, um, just to give you an idea of um, what we can do, because all of these models are described in NeuroML, um, you know, we have access to all these uh, metadata that are associated with the model. So like I said, we link out to PubMed. We link out to other resources where you can find the same model. So for instance, this model um, comes from Open Source Brain. Um, so there's a link to go directly to the project at Open Source Brain where you can um, interact with the model there, for instance, run it, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, it also links to the model in uh, ModelDB. Some of you might be familiar with ModelDB, which is a, is a large database of models, but those models can be in any format whatsoever, right? So a lot of those models are in uh, the neuron simulator um, coding language, some are in MATLAB, some are in Python, you know. But for the models that are in, um, in ModelDB, we, we link back to ModelDB. Um, you, we also link directly to like the GitHub repository underneath Open Source Brain where the models are directly available. So things like that. So we're able to do that. Um, what else do I want to say? Oh, so you can of course download the files in, in NeuroML format. Um, to use them however you want. You can also download um, code that has been automatically generated to run the model in ner the neuron simulator, for example. And we're open to adding you know, other simulators um, to, this, to this list. Um, we have libraries associated with NeuroML that will generate some of this code. And so um, you know, that's a very useful thing to have. Um, so an, another thing that we're doing at the database is that we are trying to um, make information available that helps people evaluate these models. So for instance, um, for all the cell models in the database, we're running the same protocol that is run at the um, Allen Cell Types database, um, uh, you know, that they run on, on cells where they're sharing the data at their database. We run those on the models and you can go and you can, um, uh, see how the model responds to those different protocols in sort of an interactive view. All right, so again, this is pre-run, a whole bunch of simulations, and we're just sharing the information. Um, but I guess the point is, even as the database grows, it's easy for us to do this. We can just automatically run all these um, simulations because the models are in um, NeuroML. We don't have to worry about, oh, can, I, you know, can we run this on this simulator, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's all very easy. Um, and similarly, um, if the model, well, for instance, if you're looking at a cell model and it has a complex morphology, we run that through L-Measure, um, which is a package out of Ascoli's lab. 
um, and share um, all the aspects of the morphology. We're also doing things like um, running these models in a way that we can compare runtimes and share with you in case there's some issue with this model. Let's say you need a really small step size to run the model and that's something that's important to you, right? You're looking for models that maybe aren't too computationally intensive. You can compare models, you can look at the, uh, you know, the behavior of the model and you can also learn something about how long it takes to run. Okay, all of this because of NeuroML. <laughs> And I just wanted to mention that um, these same models are searchable at NIF. So if you go to NIF, you can search, find the models, and it'll point you towards NeuromLDB. Um, so for the models that are in both NeuromLDB and ModelDB, you can actually access them at ModelDB. So if you search for models at ModelDB and they're in our database, then there's a, um, a little button you can click at the bottom to get a menu that'll take you to to um, NeuromLDB, um, so just wanted to mention that, another way to find models that are available in NeuromL format. And then I've mentioned several times um, this resource, Open Source Brain, so I wanna say a little bit more about um, Open Source Brain. So unlike the NeuromL database where we have these sort of stable snapshots of, of models to share, Open Source Brain is meant to be a collaboratory um, platform where you know you can just think of it as a place to share your models, but it's really a place where you can share models in a way that you can work on them with other people, you can um, simulate models. Um, open Source Brain is um, built on top of GitHub, so for every project at Open Source Brain, you know, uh, so if if you're if you are um, um, wanting to develop models on Open Source Brain, you create a project. It's on GitHub. You can have a wiki where you can, uh, you know, have information about the project. You can create issues just like you can with anything else at GitHub. Um, and um, you know, multiple people can access that project if if that's what you want. Um, there are um, many normal models at um, Open Source Brain. Um, Open Source Brain doesn't require that the models that are being shared there or worked on there are in NeuroML. You can use whatever you know uh, way, it, whatever simulator, whatever kind of coding you want to um, to look at models there. Um, but the the advantage of making your models there available in NeuroML format is that there are extra tools at at Open Source Brain that you can use if the models in NeuroML format. All right, um, and I should say that. All of these models on this slide um, are also available at NeuromLDB, um, and um, there are many more models at Open Source Brain other than the ones that listed here that are listed here. But the point of this slide is to make it clear that um, there are um, you know models that are single compartment models that are relatively simple. Um, up to um, single cell neuron models that are quite complex with, with very complex dendrite structures, um, you know, on up to uh, um, networks of relatively simple cells, networks of uh, very complicated cells. Um, so for instance, the, um, the cell models from the Blue Brain project that were released in 2015 are um, available on a project here. You can also get them at NeuromLDB. So you can look at all of those cell models. You can look at you know how they behave. Um, you can look at um, uh, you know their morphologies, anything like that. And uh, the, all the models mentioned this morning in the talk this morning, they're also available. Um, so I urge you to have a look at these at these resources. Okay, so at Open Source Brain, if your model is in NeuroML, there are tools for um, actually simulating the models, visualizing models, analyzing models that are all available online through the browser. Um, so for instance, you know, this is just a little screenshot of a network model um, showing a visualization of the network, a visualization of uh, uh, voltage responses in some of the um, cells when the network is run, and then uh, up here showing the connectivity matrix um, for for the network. And there are way more visualization tools there than you can see in this one image. Um, 
one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, they have the ability to, um, if you look at, this is, this is a little screenshot of one of the panels that comes up when you want to actually run a model there through the browser. And so um, you can run smaller models on open source brain, so basically, you know, uh, on Amazon or something. And, um, but there's also this option for larger models to um, send them to a queue and run them at Neuroscience Gateway. And just for those few of you who may not know what Neuroscience Gateway is, um, it is a um, um, super computer platform that's available to the community for free. Um, and um, so you can access it directly from Open Source Brain without having to um, you know, worry about how you configure all of your simulations on, on, the, um, on the gateway itself. Okay, so um, there are lots of things that I haven't told you about Open Source Brain, lots of other great aspects um, of, of Open Source Brain, um, tools that you can use there, analysis tools and things like that. Um, I just want to point you to this publication in the bioarchive that, um, that um, makes all that information available, including um, video tutorials about how to use it and what you can do with Open Source Brain. Um, there are some um, tutorials that are available that might be helpful in education for any of you who are teaching classes and you know maybe you think that open source brain might be a good thing to incorporate um, for your for your training activities um, so I urge you to have a look um, um, but clearly um, you know across these resources that I've mentioned so far what we're seeing now as um, as these become available is that, um, it's easier to reproduce models. Um, these models that are, that are at these resources are fully accessible with the needed um, metadata um, to, um, to evaluate them correctly and, and find out more about what the model is meant to represent. And, um, and uh, you know, the use of standards um, is what makes this easy. Well, maybe not easy, but possible. Okay, so I want to spend just a few minutes um, talking about this idea of model testing. All right, so another project that I work on, which is very closely related to what I've talked about so far, is a project called Neuron Unit. And um, really, the, the lead on Neuron Unit is a collaborator that I have at Arizona State University. Um, his name is uh, Richard Gherkin. And... Um, and, uh, you know, there's sort of a team of people, of course, like everything that I've mentioned, I'll say more about it at the end. There are a team of people working on it, um, but I just want to make it clear, like Open Source Brain, also not my project, um, that Neuron Unit is really Rick's project. Um, but the idea behind Neuron Unit, um, which is built, on, I should say, on top of a um, um, completely um, domain agnostic um, um, resource called SciUnit, which is meant to be much broader than just neuroscience. But Neuron Unit is the neuroscience-oriented part of SciUnit. And the idea is that, um, is, is borrowing the idea of unit testing from software development. All right, so when we're creating models, we really should be thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the tests that we require of the models? Um, we should make those tests transparent, available to the community. If we're going to publish a model, really those tests should be quite clear. Um, what is it that this model was designed to, to, to do and what is it that the model does do, right? So those would be the tests for, um, for perhaps model optimization and model val validation that, that would be important to share um, in order to have more rigorous development of models. All right, and so if you um, look at the screen here, the idea is um, you could have only one model that you're trying to evaluate, or you could have many models that are meant to model kind of the same thing, and you maybe you want to compare them. But you would model across um, maybe what you might think about as, as experimental protocols, right? So the kinds of experiments that you would do when you're, when you're you know, maybe doing electrophysiology, um, when you're recording from a cell, or, or you're getting information across an entire network, um, those are the experiments that you want to run on your model as well, right? And so this is a way of making that um, uh, formal and rigorous. 
And then the idea is that when you choose models and you choose tests, maybe from a repository of tests that we have or create your own tests, you can share the information about how the models do in those tests, um, you know, either numerically or we have visualization tools for doing that. Here I'm just showing, you know, you know just um, a matrix uh, of um, some sort of quantitative numbers that's meant to um, represent how well uh, a model does on a test. All right, so for instance, you know, just as a very simple example, maybe for a cell model, um, when you're developing the model, you have certain things in mind that you want it to do. You know, you want it to have um, a certain spike width, spike height, maybe certain membrane properties, but maybe something more complicated like th than that, maybe um, something like, you know, um, statistical properties at certain uh, frequencies of, of uh, stimulation or you know something like that. So you could create tests that test these on your model so that you can compare them to experimental data. All right, and as a quick example of that, um, um, Neuron Unit is being used in the OpenWorm project, which some of you may have heard of. So OpenWorm project is a really cool project that is community driven, um, all open source. Um, anybody can contribute. Um, and I'm sure um, some of the people here in the audience who are involved with Open Worm would be happy to talk to people about it. If you have questions, I can direct you to them. Uh, also, not my project. <laughs> um, but, um, but the idea is to create a model um, that um, um, incorporates all aspects of, um, of the worm C. elegans, um, the all of the cells in its nervous system, um, its musculature, um, how, it, how it moves in the environment. All right, so it's a truly multi-scale model that's being put together. And um, unit tests, this, these tests from, um, from neuron unit are being used to drive the development of the model. So for instance, um, using tests to develop um, models of channels, models of cells, um, the three, 302 um, cell models that uh, are needed for C. elegans in, in the network. And then also um, tests are being used to evaluate um, the um, motion model um, uh, based on videos of moving, um, moving um, worms. All right, and then all that information can be, well, I should say quickly that this is still under development. You know, these, this mo these models aren't complete by any means, but um, the idea is that the test can make the development of the model more transparent and uh, more rigorous. And then um, these tests can be shared on a portal that we have called SciDash. It's like a dashboard where you indicate what your models are, what the tests are, and uh, what, what the results of the tests are that anybody can use. All right, again, happy to answer more questions about that if, if, um, if you guys want to contact me. All right, so I hope I've um, uh, managed to um, convince you that there are a lot of really cool tools out there that are supportive of reproducibility in the computational neuroscience community. There are many, many more tools that I didn't mention at all that um, you know, maybe we'll hear about in some of the other sessions, of course. I wanted to, um, if, if this is something that's of interest to you, or maybe you want to um, share some of these ideas in your training, I want to point you to this URL um, that, um, and Pora Gleason and I think Andrew Davison were the ones that compiled this information. Um, but if you go here, you'll find a repository that has slides. Um, with introductions to these resources, so you can sort of go to one place and quickly find out about them. And there are also um, some exercises there for linking some of these resources to help people understand what kind of tool chains are out there um, for, for using some of them. Um, and so as I said, um, you know, many, many people were involved in these resources that I mentioned today. Um, specifically, um, my long-term collaborators on Neuromel, Angus Silver and um, Pora Gleason, who are, who are here. Um, and then many, many other people who have contributed over the years to Neuromel by coming to workshops and interacting with us. Um, uh, some of our current 
editors on the, on the board of editors are here also. I want to thank them for continuing to push NeuroML forward. Um, and then, um, you know, groups of people working on, of course, NeuroMLDB and, and, um, and Neuron Unit. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And there's so much uh, also parallel to be done with like our like a brain imaging communities and like uh, this, and like those those things that are common to those communities are really interesting to like see and uh, and, and talk about today. Yeah. yeah. We have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Is there any question in the burning questions? No. Actually, I do have one. Like uh, we, you do have with those uh, projects, a bit like the. The adoption and sustainability uh, uh, problems, or like uh, you know, so can you tell us a little bit more on the adoption of how uh, adoption. adoption and like, sustainability, and how like do you getting people to use them? Getting people to use, getting people to yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, I think it it takes a little bit of momentum, right? Um, so I. I you know, I don't know how this magically happens, but I think if you just show people enough times how useful this can be to them, then some, you know, some people will start to adopt it, and then it seems to sort of spread in this way. Um, but certainly a key thing is having good documentation and good tutorials um, and things of that nature. I mean, I think that's, that's really helpful. Any link with uh, uh, journals or publication that uh, are recommending or uh, those models? Or well, those not standards? yet, <laughs> but I hear that maybe this is something that will happen soon. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, any question? In the, no? If there's no burning question, Sharon, you'll be here you. like the next two days, I suppose? Yes. Like, uh, this today and tomorrow. Ben, feel and, free uh, to email me. Right. So. And uh, thank you again so much. That thank was great. You.